Why are summers at the Shalom Hartman Institute so special? Because that's when Jewish leaders and learners, like you and me, travel to Jerusalem to wrestle with big ideas and study with Hartman's inspiring faculty. The Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. Our scholars draw on 3,000 years of Jewish wisdom to develop the ideas we need to face today's challenges. This summer, the pandemic has prevented us from traveling, but it doesn't prevent us from learning together. Welcome. Join hundreds of Jewish leaders for All Together Now, a month-long celebration of ideas from the Shalom Hartman Institute. From now until July the 23rd, come learn with us in this moment of crisis and opportunity. Hello, and welcome to the in intensive Bet Midrash on this beautiful evening in Jerusalem with Israel Knoll on Is God Behind the Plague, Crisis and Transformation in the Bible? My name is Shiri Merzel, and I'm the Vice President and COO at the Shalom Hartman Institute. And I'm specifically curious to listen to Israel's lecture today since I grew up in, the, in a kibbutz in the north of Israel, which is deeply secular. And there, the only ancient Jewish, Jewish text that was considered relevant was the Bible. So here we go. This learning session is a part of All Together Now, Jewish Ideas for This Moment, from the Shalom Hartman Institute. We're excited to have more than 6,000 people studying with us during this month of uh, lectures. Jesus Bird, who is with us, will be the facilitator of this uh, session, and he will give you now some instructions of, instructions of how it works. Jesus, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Justice Baird. I'm a senior vice president for the Shalom Harman Institute of North America. Uh, three brief announcements. First, uh, during the shiur, uh, probably toward the later part, Israel Kano will be taking questions and we certainly want to hear them. So we invite you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I will be behind the scenes to curate those questions for him. Uh, you will not be able to see each other's questions. Second, uh, I wanted to just reinforce that this session is being recorded and we will strive to post the recording of this session within 48 hours. And third, uh, the sources for this session are on the same session webpage that you use to get to this Zoom link. Uh, I will also post a direct link to the sources in the chat box in a moment. And if you have a Tanakh, then you have the sources because all of Israel's sources are uh, biblical for this shiur. Back to you, Shiri. So I'm happy to introduce Israel Knoll. Israel is a senior fellow, research fellow at the Shalom Hanwell Institute. He has a doctorate in Bible from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he is the Yechezkel Kaufman Professor of Bible. Israel served as a visiting professor at University of California at Berkeley, Stanford University, and the University of Chicago Divinity School. In 2017, Israel served as the Weinstock Visiting Professor of Jewish Studies at Howard University. Israel, please. Thank you very much, Shiri. So, uh, um, I'm uh, happy to have this opportunity to talk to all of you uh, uh, about uh, the question uh, on the divine presence behind the plague or the epidemics. And is there a possibility of renewal and uh, uh, developing new ideas, new concepts, new institutions uh, out of the crisis of uh, the epidemics? And uh, I would like to say that uh, the second part of my talk is very much in the footsteps 
of Viktor Frankl uh, and his book, Man Search for Meaning. Man Search for Meaning. Uh, I'm sure some of you have read this book. Viktor Frankl was born at the beginning of the 20th century in Vienna, uh, was a student of Sigmund Freud, um, became a therapist in, in Vienna, and when the Nazis came, he was sent first to Theresienstadt, later to Auschwitz and other camps. Most of the members of his family were killed uh, during the Holocaust. He himself survived. And some years after uh, the war, short, uh, shortly after the war, he wrote his famous book, Man Search for Meaning, and developed his psychological method, which is called logotherapy. In this book, uh, he criticized both Sigmund Freud and Adler for their theories about the character of human beings. He was not ready or willing to accept the views that man is uh, moved mainly for getting uh, fulfillment of his desires, uh, either sexual desires or control desires. He did not negate that these instincts are within human beings, but for him, he emphasized that the main urge of human beings is to have meaning to his life, to have meaning to his suffering. And in his book, he described with, in a very um, realistic way the life within Auschwitz. And his claim was that the key for survival in Auschwitz was the ability to give meaning to your life there. He said prisoners in Auschwitz could not decide on most of their everyday life. They were controlled by the Nazi regime. However, there was a possibility for each individual to decide if he sees some meaning in his suffering, if he gives some meaning to his life there, either by helping other individuals, by sticking to some remaining of his previous life, either in a religious observance or cultural activity, whatever was possible. But this was the free choice of the prisoners. They could decide to go into total despair, and this would lead, in his eyes, to their deaths, those who could find, even in the darkness of Auschwitz, some way to give meaning and importance to their suffering could survive. This was his diagnosis. This was the basic of his book and his philosophical, psychological method, logotherapy, to understand a meaning, to give a meaning to suffering, to life in general. I think that 
the text that we are going to discuss today is in many ways uh, about this question. How can we give meaning to disaster, to a terrible plague, to a suffering of thousands of people, which is seem in the first glance as to, to be arbitrary, without any meaning. So the story starts with some very difficult and unexplained activity of God, who is behind the plague, who is behind the epidemics. We read in 2 Samuel 24, this is, by the way, the last chapter of the book of Samuel. It comes after a song of David, after a list of the heroes of David. Suddenly, in the last moment before the book is over, we have this strange chapter with strange opening. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. Astonishing. God was again angry of, about the people of Israel. We don't know what was the previous time that he was angry. It is not connected to, specifically to any story that we read before that in the book of Samuel. Very strange. But God was angry about Israel, so what did he do? He incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. God is functioning here as the inciting one. Very strange. Like the serpent in the garden. This is the role that God is playing here. He is angry about Israel. He incited David to number them. And we know from the Torah that the belief was that if you number people, this is a, a, can be a source of a plague, of epidemics. We read it in the last source that you have in, in page number five. It is said at the beginning of the portion, uh, Kitisa. It is said that uh, the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then it shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. So there is a dangerous of a plague of an epidemic when you count the number of, of Israel, and they have to give some ransom for it. So it was known to David that this is dangerous. However, he was incited by God. So even though his commanders, uh, Joab, which he sent uh, to make this census, said to him, this is dangerous. Don't do that. Why would you do that? But David, he was incited by God. Who can go against the incitement of God. So he said, no, 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 I want you to do that. And David and Joab and his men uh, went over all Israel and counted them, and they came back uh, with the number of the people. So a prophet came to him afterwards. 
and told him, this is verse 12, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you, choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So God came to David and told him, you have three options. The first one is three years without food. The other one is three months that you are running from your enemies, a military defeat. The third one is three days of pestilence. It is up to you. You can decide. You can choose. And David said, uh, this is verse 14, Then David said to God, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of men. I prefer not to fall in the hands of an enemy, of a military attack of the enemy. I don't trust human beings. I trust God. Why? Because his mercies are great. Namely, I prefer to get the pestilence because the pestilence was connected in the conception of the people with God. There is a beautiful description of God coming in uh, the last book, the last chapter of Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3. And it said there that God is coming uh, and before him and after him are angels of pestilence. So he was associated. And David said, the Hebrew is, Vayomer David el Gad, Niplana beyad Adonai ki rabim rachamav uveyad adam alepola. I prefer to fall in the hands of God because his mercy is great. This verse is used even in these days in the daily prayer, in the portion which is called Tachanun, asking for the mercy of God. So the custom in the synagogue is that you fall on your face. Uh, we don't fall on the earth, but what we do is uh, we put our hand in this way, and we say, Vayomer David el Gad, Tsar li meod, Niplana beyad Adonai ki rabim rachamav uveyad adam alepola. This is how it is done every day in the synagogue. A trust in the mercy of God. And then we say a psalm, one of the psalms. However, in our story, I believe that this verse is written with great irony. With great irony. Why? You can follow what happened. This is verse 15. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and their and, uh, people died uh, from Dan, which is in the north uh, of Israel, very close to the kibbutz where Shiri came from. Dan is very much near Daphna, am I right? Yes, okay. To Beersheba, which is the city of the Negev. 70,000 men. In a short time, 70,000 men died. This is the great mercy of God? Not so much, I would say. Because of this, I claim that it is written with some irony here. This is a very strange, a very strange 
divinity who is acting here. First, inciting David to count them. Then the punishment is horrible. And it is also, I would say, in our moral dimension, this is very much unfair. Because one person, David, committed a sin and who is paying the price? The price is paid by thousands of people, 70,000 people from Israel. It, these are men, women, women, children, probably also babies, because this is the way that pestilence is moving. It's a very uh, um, infectious uh, epidemic, spreading, spreading very, very quickly, very fast. And thousands of people are dying in very quickly. But what did they do? They didn't do anything wrong. It was David, the king, who sinned. So why should they be punished for the sin of David? And also about David himself, would I be hired by David to represent him as a lawyer, I would go and say, okay, also David is not really to be blamed because it was not his free choice. I spoke at the beginning about possibilities of free choice. He wasn't cited by God. What could he do? So actually... The one who started the whole thing is the God of Israel. This seems to be very strange and unfair. Many were astonished by this story and found it very, very difficult. It is very interesting that Within the Bible itself, we can see the imprints of this difficulty. Um, in page number three, in page number three, you can see the second source, which is uh, from the book of Chronicles, chapter 21. And it is very interesting to compare the two opening verses. In Samuel, it is said, Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. In Chronicles, it is a different um, version. Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, go number Israel. So suddenly it is not the Lord who did it. It's not Adonai like it is in Second Samuel. The incitement here is taken, taken from the Lord, and there is some other who is blamed to be the inciter. This is Satan. Somehow, Satan 
was born between the date of 2 Samuel, probably, let's say, around the 7th century BC, to the date of Chronicles, probably in the 5th century BC. In those 200 years, Satan was born. And he was born to take away from God uh, some of the, let's say, the ugly acts. It is strange and ugly and difficult to describe the God of Israel as the inciter, as the one who caused all these epidemics. He started it according to the story in Samuel. So Chronicles is, uh, is saying to himself, I don't know what accent he spoke, but let us assume that the author of Chronicles spoke in a little bit of Yiddish, so or Ash some Ashkenazi accent, and he said to himself, Chos Sholom. Can we say about God that he did all this terrible thing to incite David and then to punish the people of Israel so thousands of people are killed? This is impossible to refer it to God. I will change it to Satan. This is an act of Satan, not of God. Of course, you can ask uh, about Satan always, not just in this case, also in other cases, like in the be beginning of the book of Job, where Satan is very active. Uh, who is Satan? Who, whose commandments he is uh, performing? Uh, it's not that clear. I'm not sure that the solution of the of Chronicles is absolutely perfect. That we we now don't have any theological question. But what we can see is anyhow two things. That in the older version, the version of Samuel, God is behind the epidemics. He is behind the plague. He is behind the pestilence. No question about it in the book of Samuel. He is behind of it. Why? Why did he do that? We don't understand. His anger is not explained. This is not a moral, rational divinity who acts here. I might use the terminology of Rudolf Otto in his book, The Idea of the Holy, uh, to coin this behavior as belonging to the numinous aspects of God, to the aspects of God who are beyond morality, ethics, and human understanding. This is the mystery of God, which we, can, we cannot understand in our, uh, our moral and rational thinking. It is clear. However, another thing that we can see here that, and this is about David, who committed this sin, and the people who is punished because of the behavior of David, the king. So we can see, and this is, I believe, also important for us to see in these days, both in the U.S. and in Israel, that many times, many times, the people is paying for the wrong deeds and the mistakes of the rulers or of the political leaders. 
the political leader behaved wrong for some reason, and actually those who pay the heavy price are the people. This is the essence, one of essential motif in this story. However, at some moment, there was a shift in the story. I'm reading from verse 15. Uh, sorry, I, I will go back to, to, one, to Second Samuel, the first, uh, uh, the first version that we have, uh, source number one. Uh, verse 16. And when the angel stretched forth his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented of the evil and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand, and the angel of the Lord was by the stretching floor of Avana the Jebusite. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. God, in a way, repented, regretted what he did. It is the Hebrew is Vayinachem Adonai El Hara'a. God regretted, repented. This is also not so easy always to understand because in some places in the Bible, in some some other place in the book of Samuel, it is said, Kinetzach Yisrael lo yeshaker velo yinachem ki lo adam hu leinachem. God is never lying. He does not regret or repent because all these are human typical acts and behavior. To, to lie or to regret, or, this is not for God. However, here it is said in the same book of Samuel that God regretted and repented. And he stopped, he stopped the angel where the danger was close to Jerusalem. He stopped the angel. So... And David also regretted. This is verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was smiting the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But this sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. So... It's very interesting. I spoke before about the terrible things that political leaders are sinning or doing wrong, and other people, namely the simple people, are suffering due to the sin or the mistake or the stupidness sometimes of the leader. David was not aware at the beginning of the story when the three options were suggested to him three options of punishment, he did not say to himself, 
How can I get pestilence? Uh, pestilence will kill so many people. And I have committed a sin. They did not sin. Why should they punish? He should say at the beginning to the Lord what he just said now, that this is very unfair. Why should they suffer because of my wrongdoing? Punish me. Punish my family, not the entire people. So it took him to see the awful results of the pestilence. 70,000 men dying in a short time to be aware that this option is very much immoral and unfair. He didn't notice it at the beginning, but now he's realizing and what happened and he is asking not to punish the people anymore. Then the prophet God appears next time. And God came that day to David and said to him, Go up, rear an altar to the Lord on the stretching floor of Avana the Jebusite. Usually, the stretching floor is uh, on the top of the city, in an empty field on top is, of the city, because there, there is a lot of wind, uh, which is good for this uh, stretching. And the area belong to Arvana, the Jebusite. Why Arvana? Why Jebusite? Who is Arvana, the, the Jebusite? There are hints in the text that probably Arvana, the Jebusite, was the former king of Jerusalem. Because if we remember, David took the city of Jerusalem, conquered the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusite. They ruled the city uh, in the time before David. Who are the Jebusite? How did they come to Jerusalem? We have good reasons to assume that the Jebusite were Hittite tribe. The Hittite empire was a very strong empire uh, in the ancient Near East uh, in the second millennium, but in a very difficult, uh, probably uh, disasters due to uh, uh, warming situation of the climate. This is not just a modern problem. In the around the year uh, 100, uh, 1200 BC, this is the transition between the Bronze period to the Iron period. There was uh, a long time with with uh, almost no no rain very high climate and, and, and uh, uh, temperatures and, and no rain in the area of the, uh, of the ancient Near East. The only, the only area who did, or, or kingdom, who had food and had uh, support of food was Egypt. And all countries asked from Egypt help with food. We have letters from the king of the Hittite Empire which were sent to Egypt, saying to Egypt, uh, I am dying. My people are starving. We don't have anything to eat. 
please send us score and help us. I will pay whatever price you would ask for. And we have evidence that shipment of corn really took place from Egypt to the Hittite Empire. Uh, many people tried to move to Egypt in order to get food. This is the time where the Philistines, who came probably from Greece and Kypros, uh, went to Egypt and tried to get food. If this reminds you the story of Joseph, I think this is not just an accident. I think it is connected with this period. However, the shipment of corn from Egypt to the Hittite land, which is modern Turkey, Anatolia, did not help. They collapsed. They collapsed. And people ran away from Anatolia, from the, Hittite, the broken Hittite empire, to many corners in order to save their life. Probably the city of Jerusalem, which was a Canaanite city originally, was conquered by the Jebusites, who were Hittite group at that time. And when David came to Jerusalem and wanted to build his capital there, he had to fight against the Jebusite and to take the city from them. Probably Alvena was the former king uh, of the city. The name Alvena is Aruno in Hittite is king. So probably this is not a personal name, but this is the title of the former king of Jerusalem. Why did David decide to make Jerusalem to be his capital? As Binyamin Mazal suggested many years ago, it was a brilliant idea of David because the situation, to remind you, and this is told in length in the book of Samuel, that David was from the tribe of Judah. The king of Israel was Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. And he was envy of David. He tried to kill David. At the end, Saul died in a very tragic way in the mountain of Gilboa. He was defeated by the Philistines, who were the greatest enemy of Israel in this period. After the death of Saul, there was a split within, Israel, within the people of Israel. The tribe of Judah followed David, and he was crowned in the city of Hebron, south of Jerusalem, to be the king of the tribe of Judah. However, the other tribes of Israel, the majority of the people of Israel, followed a person with the name Ishbosheth or Ishbal, uh, who was the son of Saul. And they were against David. And for years, there was a war between Israel and Judah, between the camp of the followers of Ishbosheth or Ishbal and the camp of the followers of David. After several years, David won the battle, and all the tribes of Israel came to him to Hebron to ask him, Now you should be 
our king. We accept you, a king of the entire people of Israel. So this was a very great moment in the life of David. But however, he had a very delicate and difficult problem uh, where to make his capital. Would he stay in Hebron? Probably the northern tribe, the ten northern tribes, would not see it in a good way. Because they will continue to say, you are from the tribe of Judah. This is why you prefer a city, Hebron, in the midst of the people of Judah. You don't trust us. However, would he go to the other side and would make his uh, capital, let's say, in the city of Shechem, Shechem, who was a very central city in the northern uh, part of Israel. Uh, probably his brothers, his relatives from the time, the tribe of Judah, would say, oh, we follow you all these years. We fought for you all these years. And what you do to pay us for our uh, efforts you are leaving us, and you are going to the north with the northern tribes. This is not nice. So whatever he would do would be perceived wrongly by one part of, of, the, of the people of Israel. So Binyamin Mazar said, David had a smart political idea. What did he decide to do? He said, there is this city of Jerusalem. This is in the middle, in the border between Judah and Benjamin. If you would read the book of Joshua, you would see that Jerusalem is just in the border between the, the, the northern border of Judah and the southern border of Benjamin. Namely, in the big uh, map, in the big picture, it is just on the border between Judah and the rest of the tribes. So it's in the middle. Because it was held in the hands of the Hittites, it was not identified with any tribe. So it is a neutral city, a neutral place. So this would be politically, politically, the perfect city to make your capital if you want to please both Judah and Israel, because each of them can see this city as part of his territory. However, Jerusalem was problematic from another aspect. Hebron and Shechem are very old cities with holy memories for the people of Israel. If you would open uh, the book of Genesis, you would find there that Abraham was very much associated with, with Shechem and with Hebron. He built altars there. He called the Lord there. This is also uh, true about Jacob, when he came back uh, from uh, the house of Lavan, the Aramite, he bought a piece of land in the city of Shechem and built an altar there and made sacrifices to the Lord. So these two cities had, uh, were accepted 
in the collective memory of the people of Israel as being very sacred, connected uh, to the patriarchs. However, if you would look to find the name of Jerusalem in Genesis, you would not find it. It is not that Jerusalem is a new city. It is very old city. It is mentioned in some Egyptian text from the 18th century BC. So the city existed for sure in the time of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. However, for some reason, it was this, this city on the plain reading. I know that Mount Moria is mentioned in, in Genesis, but it is not connected to the city of Jerusalem. The city is not mentioned in a simple way. I know that some of you remember the story of Mal Malkitzedek, the king of Shalem, uh, which is in the uh, 14th chapter of the book of Genesis, that Abraham respected him and uh, he blessed Abraham. Yes, it is possible that Shalem is Jerusalem, but some others are claiming that Shalem is to be located near Shechem. So it is not a closed, a clear-cut issue. There is no simple evidence in the entire book of Genesis that Jerusalem was sacred. So what shall David do with that? Uh, David tried to give sanctity to Jerusalem uh, by bringing the Ark of the Covenant uh, to Jerusalem from Kiryat Yarim. So the Ark, which was the most sacred, Arona Brit, the Ark of the Covenant, which was most sacred, uh, the most sacred object of the people of Israel, uh, was taken by the Philistines, against the Philistines, the, this uh, uh, strong enemy, uh, in the time of Eli, uh, the high priest of, of Shiloh, and it was captured by the Philistines, brought back then to Beth Shemesh, and then was sent uh, to Kiryat Yarim. So David, at the moment, at the very moment that the entire people recognized him as a king, he sent to bring the ark from Kiryat Yarim to Jerusalem. Okay, this was one step. But still, unlike Shechem, and Hebron, who had very ancient sanctuaries in them. In Jerusalem, there was no sanctuary. David, when he brought uh, the Ark of the Covenant, put it in Jerusalem in a tent. So the Ark was in Jerusalem, in a tent, like it was in the time of the wandering in the desert. Uh, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was a moving sanctuary who went with the people from, of Israel from place to place. And the Levites would uh, uh, take the ark with them from one station to another station, and when they camp in any station, they would rebuild the tabernacle and put the ark inside it. So I would say that the fact that the ark was still in a tent is a symbol of a situation which is limited in time, because this tent 
can go from Jerusalem to another place, and the ark would move to another place. It's a temporal arrangement, not stable one. And indeed, David was troubled with it. And as it is told in the book of Samuel, he wanted to build a temple for the Lord, a stable temple from wood of cedar. And he came to Nathan, another prophet who lived in his time, and told him about his wish. At first, Nathan said to him, okay, this is fine, go and do it. Later on, God spoke to him and said, no, 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 I don't want a stable place. I'm still with the idea of moving in a tabernacle or tent. I have some Bedouin aspects in my personality. I like the freedom to move from here to there. Your son, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet to move to a solid temple. Ah, your son, he will do it. Uh, in another place, it is said, David, you cannot build the temple to the Lord. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. Yadecha damim maleu. You are a warrior. You are a man of war. You have killed many people. Uh, your hands, in a symbolic way, are full of blood. The temple is Beit Shalom, is a house of peace. You cannot build a house of peace where your hands are full of blood. So I would say most of the time of David, the situation was kept in this way. Since the wish to build a stable temple was rejected by God, David did not go even to look for a place. The prize was that the sanctity of Jerusalem was not yet very much accepted by the people. We have a story at the beginning of uh, um, the story about uh, uh, Solomon days, that when he was crowned, he went to Gibeon, which is n in the northern part, uh, 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 above Jerusalem, northern to Jerusalem, in the territory of Benjamin, uh, uh, to sacrifice there. Why did he go? Why did he go to Gibeon? So the book of Chronicles, who was troubled by it, uh, this you can you can see it, you can see it. Uh, at the end of uh, 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 source two, in page four, it is said, um, uh, verse 29, for the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness, and the altar of burnt offering were at that time in the high place of Gibeon. That, that, Gibeon was more sacred, more sacred from Jer oh, than Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not really perceived as a real sacred place uh, by the people. 
even by the family of David. However, as a result, as a result of this terrible pestilence, there was a shift. There was a change. David bought, David bought the piece of land from Avana the Jebusite. This was higher above the city, above what we call now the city of David. The city of David is a narrow hill, narrow hill uh, now from the area of the temple of the uh, western wall, the Wailing Wall, uh, towards south to the Pool of Shiloh, if you know the area, if you visited the area of old Jerusalem. Very narrow, uh, very narrow hill. However, when it goes to the northern part, it becomes higher and wider. And this is area, this is the area of Arvana. It is above the city of David. It was outside of the walls of the city of David. But David was specifically commanded by God to build there an altar. So he insisted, Avana wanted to give it for free. David insisted to pay uh, for it, and he paid for it. And he built an altar to the Lord there, and he brought sacrifices. At the moment that he did it, at the moment that he did it, the pestilence was over. The sacrifices on this altar on top of Jerusalem stopped the pestilence in a very miraculous way. The epidemics stopped in one moment, just before the angel of the pestilence uh, 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 did anything wrong to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was saved by the sacrifice of David on this altar. So at the end of the story of Chronicles, I'm sorry for the mistake I did not uh, include it in the sources that you have, but I will read it to you. Immediately after the end of this story, in the first verse of uh, First Chronicle chapter 22, those of you who have uh, a Bible can open it now. Again, uh, Chronicles 1 Chapter 22, verse 1, it is said, Vayomer David, Zehu bet Adonai ha Elohim, Veze Mizbeach leola le Israel. And David said, when he saw that the sacrifices on this altar stopped the pestilence, David said, This is the house of the Lord, God, and this is the altar of sacrifice for Israel. Namely, uh, I will make the arrangements for building here a house for the Lord. Actually, David just started the arrangement of the project. The project itself of building the temple was done by Solomon. But the location, the location of the temple was decided through the time of this horrible pestilence. This altar that David built on the piece of earth that he bought, Bowed from Avana, the former 
Jebusite king of Jerusalem, became the location of the altar of the Solomonic temple. And later on, this was the location of the temple of the people who returned from Babylon. And this is the location where Herod built his temple uh, at uh, uh, the beginning of, in the, in the uh, uh, first century BC. And this is the location of the temple of uh, uh, the Mount of Temple today and the uh, location of Kotel Amaravi, the Western Wailing Wall. So in fact, I would like to say that the end of the story, the end of the story is that the sanctity and holiness of Jerusalem to, uh, uh, till these days, till our time, this is the most sacred place for the Jewish people. And the sanctity of this holy place was created as a result of the epidemics, as a result of the terrible pestilence that God, or Satan, if you prefer the version of Chronicles, inflicted Israel with this terrible pestilence. But the final result was the establishment of the sanctity of Jerusalem in general and the area of the Temple Mount specifically. So going back to Viktor Frankl and to logotherapy, I would like to say that this strange and difficult story that we have uh, in the Bible in two versions is, in my view, very much connected with the issue of logotherapy because it is the most weird, strange, and difficult portrait of God, I believe, in the entire Bible. The questions, the arguments from a moral point of view about this story are so many. It is so difficult to digest the figure, the behavior, uh, the psychological portrait, whatever you want, of God uh, 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 behind this story. No wonder, as I said, that chronicles who wanted to justify God, to make a step for the theodicy, for justification of God, took the responsibility for this terrible story from God and put it in the hands of Satan. Because actually, this is a satanic behavior. The God behind the plague is, is, is behaving here in a satanic way. This is what Chronicles said. It's not God, it is Satan. Whoever behaves like this is Satan. It can't be God. However, in a very interesting way, the story is shifting from this difficulty on the portrait of God and also the moral problems 
of with the behavior of David who is seeing the unfairness for choosing pestilence, he see it only after the death of many thousands of, of the people. Just in this late moment, he say, oh, I'm very sorry, they are not responsible. Punish me and my family, not the people. All of this, I would say, the figure of David is not coming great outside of this story. I wouldn't make him, uh, on the basis of this story, as a moral, uh, I would say, a model for uh, a ruler of Israel. It is not. It is not. However, after all these difficulties, the last point of the story is a shift. Because in some mysterious way, from this difficult plague, from these difficult epidemics, horrible pestilence, there is a result, an astonishing result. The sanctity of Jerusalem was established. A location for the future temple was chosen. And basically, one of the, I would say, one of the central elements in the history and the tradition of the Jewish people, the sanctity of Jerusalem was actually established as a result of this terrible plague. So I believe that our altar, in a very rich and interesting way, is saying to us, maybe we cannot justify God if we see him as the source behind the pestilence. If the plague is indeed a result of the divine will, we have no way to perceive it as a moral activity. This is a very strange behavior of God. But what can I do? God, besides his moral, reasonable dimensions, has also this numinous aspect, which is beyond morality and reasoning. This is the situation. What can we do is to try to give the suffering of the epidemics a meaning. When David built the altar and stopped the epidemics, and on the same spot later the temple was built by Solomon and by this the sanctity of Jerusalem was established for generations to come by the Jewish people, and all Jews in the entire world prayed and are praying till our days to the direction of the city of Jerusalem and to the direction of the location of the temple, all of this was established as a result of these terrible epidemics. So at the end, the suffering of the epidemics had a very deep and important meaning. This is, I believe, the lesson that we are taught by this chapter at the end of the book of Samuel. 
this is the lesson that we can take from this story to our time, to our days, to our situation. Uh, I'm now uh, ready to take questions. Thank you so much, Israel Kanal, for, uh, for that shiur. I, I will never be able to separate my connection to Jerusalem from, uh, from a plague now because of listening uh, to you today. There are many questions from, uh, from the few hundred people who are studying with you right now. The first set of questions are around just making sure we fully understand the story itself. So there's a, a few questions about whether from the text, do we know what David's sin was? Do we know why God was angry? And does, who, who do you think the text is challenging more in terms of their moral bankruptcy in the story? Is the text criticizing David more or God more? Because as you said, both of them seem to be not coming off well in this text. Uh, uh, the picture of God is more problematic because it is not said at all why was he anger on the people of Israel? Uh, why was he angry on the people of Israel? We don't understand his anger. And uh, incitement is very difficult to, to, to per perceive uh, God as, as doing it. Uh, so this is, I would say, the most difficult problem. And this is why Chronicles uh, moved it to uh, the hands of Satan. Uh, David is problematic, but uh, I would say that God is more in this story. Okay, thank you. And do we know? Do we know why? Do we know what David's sin was, and do we know why God was angry? It was to that he count the people according to the biblical perception. This was a sin, as it is told uh, in the Torah in the opening of the. Parashat Kitisa, uh, this is the last source that uh, uh, you have uh, in the sources. Why they saw that uh, counting the number of the people is dangerous, we don't understand it. We don't understand it. Okay. Uh, Judith Bloom asks that maybe, maybe the people who died in the plague in the story are, are paying a price because they did not rebuke their leader for David's leadership. What, what do you have a comment about that? Uh, excuse me, would you please repeat the question? Sure, so in trying to understand why innocent people would die during the plague, um, one participant asked that maybe the, the people are paying the price because they did not stand up to David, they did not Rebuke yes, uh, yes, of course, they are punished be because of the misbehavior of their king. That's true. The leaders <laughs> sinned and the people are punished. Uh -huh. Okay, the next question is just a little bit more technical about connecting the location of the threshing floor to the temple in Jerusalem. Are, are, are you saying that the that the exact location of the altar that David built on the threshing floor became the same location as the altar in Solomon's temple and in the later temples. Yes, yes. This is, uh, I, I believe that this comes out from the book of Chronicles, uh, uh, saying that David said, this, is, uh, this will be the location of the temple. Uh, this altar... Uh, would be the location of the altar of the temple, which will be built by Solomon. Okay. Um, another question from Rabbi David Cooper that just came in. Uh, he's, you, you're, the summary of, of the shiur is that establishing the sanctity of, of Jerusalem is the way that we make meaning out, out of this plague. And he asks if that 
you know, is that theologically viable? Is that, is that enough meaning for the suffering of thousands and thousands of, of people? Does it, in terms of how you understand the story that the, that the text is, is giving us, does it feel like enough to make meaning out of, out of such death and destruction? Uh, I, I would say uh, it, it uh, does not justify the suffering. Uh, I don't think uh, going back, going back to Viktor Frankl, uh, he's not talking about, and by the way, he, uh, he was very much connected to his Jewish roots all his life, even though he was married to a Catholic wife, his second wife was Catholic, but he behaved very, he put feeling every day. So he was a very interesting person also in this way. I don't think that he ever wanted to justify theologically what happened in Auschwitz, to say uh, this person committed sin and for this reason he was punished. You know that after the war, that there was those who said uh, the, the, the Satme Rebbe who was escaped uh, by the uh, uh, Kestner uh, train from, uh, was, was claiming that uh, um, the, the, the Holocaust was a result of Zionism. Uh, there were also some uh, Zionistic uh, people who said this was a punish more punishment of the ultra-Orthodox who rejected uh, the Zionistic uh, wish to go to Jerusalem. You know, everybody can put a blame on the other and say he was punished by God because he did wrong. Um, this is not what I have, what Frankel suggested. It is not about justifying the behavior of God. I don't think the behavior, if you believe that God was behind the Holocaust, I don't think that his behavior can ever be justified morally. We are not talking about theodicy and justification of God. We are talking about a human effort which is separated from, from the activities of God to give some uh, value, to, see it, to give some meaning to the suffering. I believe this is the essence of uh, Viktor Frankl's book and his logotherapy method. And I see this story as an effort in this direction. It is not to justify God, to say that uh, he did it in a right way and a moral way because as a result of it, a location for the temple was chosen. This is not the story. We are not talking about theodicy and justification of God. We are talking about some meanings that us as human beings can understand uh, to give value to our suffering. This is the issue. Okay, thank you. So two, two more questions and then we'll close up. Um, one is a, a question coming from Mary Jane Sussman that um, maybe the, the meaning of the plague and the suffering from the plague is that it caused David to be able to see finally his, his sin and then caused David to reestablish a relationship with God and, and with the people? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, I, I would agree that the change in David's recognition of his fault uh, uh, was a fault in the sense that he was willing to accept the suffering of the people for his deed. Uh, this uh, development of of David's uh, personality and responsibility, I think it's another positive value of uh, the process. I agree. 
I agree. We can see it as a, as also as a, a positive side effect of the story. Yes. Okay. And last question from Baruch Friedman Cole. Um, ask you to kind of maybe shift from being a, a teacher of Tanakh to being a little more prophetic yourself. To he, he asked what what spiritual lesson or spiritual structure might we build today from Magifa Corona, from the Corona plague that we are experiencing based on your interpretation of this text? Uh, I think uh, there are some issues which are very, I would say, open uh, to personal situation and personal behavior. I will share with you an experience that I had during Corona time. Uh, both me uh, and my wife, who is an author of uh, uh, novels and plays, we, we sat home and uh, we decided together to work on documentary about prophecy in the Bible. We would not get to do it together without the corona. So from a very personal point of view, this is some meaning that I give to the situation of the corona because it led us to new creativity in, in something that we never done before and we wouldn't think to do without the corona. So this is not justifying the suffering justifying the dying people, but finding for ourselves some meaning. This is an example that I would give. Okay. Thank you, Professor Canole, for teaching us today and for your um, illumination of the text in this way and of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, we invite everyone to please complete the uh, brief evaluation at the, as the session closes. Thank you again uh, for teaching us from Jerusalem. You're welcome. I was happy and uh, shalom, shalom and good health to all of you. I hope to see you in Jerusalem next year. Bebriot, with good health.